Well, thank you, praise team, for leading us in that um, time together in worship, um, thinking about the victory that we have in Jesus Christ. Uh, we're going to talk, continue to talk about the Lord and what He has done and what He offers us today in, in John chapter 4. So if you'd like to go ahead and um, turn there in your Bibles, John chapter 4, uh, we'll look at verses 7 through 12 this morning. John chapter 4, verses 7 through, I'm sorry, 7 through 14. John 4, 7 through 14. There came a woman of Samaria to draw water. Jesus said to her, Give me a drink. For his disciples had gone away into the city to buy food. Therefore the Samaritan woman said to him, How is it that you, being a Jew, ask me for a drink, since I am a Samaritan woman? For Jews have no dealings with Samaritans. Jesus answered and said to her, If you knew the gift of God and who it is who says to you, Give me a drink, you would have asked him, and he would have given you living water. She said to him, Sir, you have nothing to draw with, and the well is deep. Where then do you get that living water? You are not greater than our father Jacob, are you, who gave us the well and drank of it himself and his sons and his cattle? Jesus answered and said to her, Everyone who drinks of this water will thirst again, but whoever drinks of the water that I will give him shall never thirst. But the water that I will give him will become in him a well of water springing up to eternal life. So we're going to look at um, Jesus and how he cares. Uh, we're going to rec see that in, in these, this scripture today and, and looking at some other examples of his life. But if we think about caring, I want to uh, take notice of um, that today is Blue Sunday Day of Prayer. And maybe you saw the church sign and the pinwheels out front. That's, um, that's to remind us uh, of today, Blue Sunday Day of Prayer. And it's a day that we pray for children. And it's, you know, we think about it with our church, you know, so we are so blessed with um, Alexa, with our, with our children's ministry and the, and the others that are involved in volunteering and helping with, with our children. It's a blessing to be a, a part of the church and um, with, with families and young families and new babies and baby dedications and all that. That's, all, that's a great blessing um, to be able to um, experience that as a, as a body of Christ together. Uh, but we also recognize that there are children in this world who are neglected and children that are abused. And as we think about caring, children are in a situation where they are dependent on care. They're dependent on somebody else um, to help them in their lives. And so that's why it's such a sad situation. And so that's what Blue Sunday Day of Prayer is all about. It's praying for, for those children, to pray for God to, um, to help them and to bring help into their lives. And it's also a day to pray for those who help the children, those who volunteer their time, or those who have jobs that, that help, in ch help children in these situations where they can bring about um, some positive change um, or take them out of that bad situation. And so uh, uh, that's, if you didn't see the sign, I posted it on Facebook um, this morning. Uh, take a look at that, and that's um, our Blue Sunday Day of Prayer. So let's go ahead and have a, a moment of prayer. Father, I do thank you for this time today as we think of um, this Sunday, um, as this Sunday, this day of prayer. Um, we do pray for children. We thank you for our children and the involvement that we're able to have in their lives, our children and grandchildren, children here at the church, and children with, uh, for our friends and family members. And I pray, Father, that you would just continue to bring those blessings that you have. But also, we want to pray for those children who are in, in a bad situation, who are in in a time of struggle and uh, neglect or abuse. And I pray, Father, that you help them to be able to, that their situation could change or to be able to be taken out of that, out of that negative and bad situation. I pray, Father, also for those who, um, who work and help and volunteer their time to, to um, help and assist with children. And so I pray, Father, that you would bless them and give them wisdom on, and so they know what to do to, to bring about your results. So, Father, we just um, lift up children on this day of prayer. In Jesus' name, amen. So we know that um, Jesus came to serve. I mean, we've been talking about that. And uh, we have to recognize that he came to serve because he cares. That's, that's something that we, that we see um, in the life of Jesus. And it's interesting, when you're involved in ministry over time, you can you're in, you're interact with people who serve and who help and uh, who are who different, do different areas of ministry, maybe within the church and, or other churches, other situations. 
But sometimes, if we're not careful, we will be tempted to serve out of obligation. And then as we serve out of obligation, we do the work, but we really don't do it because we care. We don't really do it with the right motivation, the right heart, the right attitude along the way. And so that's a temptation that we have to be able to um, overcome and recognize and follow the example of Jesus. We recognize that he cared, and then as a result of that caring, we see um, this service that comes from him. So we learn from his motivation. We learn from his actions and, and some, of the, some of the situations behind the scenes that led to the, the serving that Jesus gave. And so today I just want to kind of look at his life and look what we can learn um, from Jesus in our own life so that we can be the type of caring person uh, that God wants us to be. Um, so let's just take a look at Jesus. Um, first of all, we know that Jesus cares about everyone. And we just need to remember that. I mean, we're, that's probably a statement that, yeah, we'd all agree with, but we need to really think of, of what that really means um, in our lives and in the life of Jesus. So we find Jesus here in um, John chapter 4. He's in Samaria. Now, we have to remember that the Jewish people, uh, many of them would, would, um, they would try to stay away from and avoid Samaria at all costs. Samaria um, was, it's the Samaritan people. They were a, uh, a group that uh, because they were part of Israel of the north, uh, invaded by Assyria, and over time and through that invasion that they just um, started to intermarry with foreigners. And so this, this line of Israel and this, uh, the true line of Israel, um, it just got all mixed in with other, with other nations in, in all of this. And so the group called the Samaritans, these people that came back and settled that land, they're, they're somehow closely, you know, they're related to the Jews, but never stayed as faithful as the people of, of Judah. Um, in the south, as far as, you know, not intermarrying and things like that. And so they, the Jews didn't like the Samaritans. They, they looked at them with disdain, and they, and they didn't want to be around them and, and, uh, and would try to avoid them. By the way, that same attitude over time started, you know, the, the Samaritans had some of those same feelings towards, towards the Jews. So if you ever look at a map of, of Israel... What you would find is that the Jews of that day, they would, um, if they were going to leave um, Jerusalem, let's say, or leave Judah and head, um, and head north, let's say, to Galilee, uh, they wouldn't just go through Samaria. They would cross over the Jordan River onto the east side of the river and then cross and then go up on the east side of the river, go north from there. And then once they got um, near the land of Galilee, then they would cross back over so they could avoid Samaria completely. But Jesus didn't do that. He and his disciples, they're leaving um, um, Jerusalem, heading back to Galilee, and they're just going to go right on through um, Samaria. Samaria, and, um, and we're probably very familiar with this particular story. Jesus is sitting at this well. The Samaritan woman comes up. He asks her for a drink, and then by that, she's actually pretty shocked that he does that. If you look at verse 9 again, it says, How is it that you, being a Jew, ask me for a drink since I am a Samaritan woman? And then John gives us a little cultural understanding here by saying, for Jews have no dealings with the Samaritans. But Jesus cares about everyone. Uh, the, as I mentioned, the Jews didn't like the Samaritans, and so uh, the Jews would avoid Samaria. Um, also, another strike against her, I guess, is that Jewish men did not normally talk to women in public. They just kind of ignored them. And so, uh, so that's something else that would happen. Jewish men wouldn't, they wouldn't um, uh, interact with, uh, Jewish men wouldn't interact with women. Something else about this story that we understand that would just cause her to be in shock that Jesus would even speak to her is it's about noontime. And we need to understand that um, the gathering of water on a daily basis from this well was probably something that happened early in the morning. And it was, it was a community event. All the ladies would go up to the well together. They had the opportunity to visit with one another and talk about things, get their jars and uh, buckets filled with water, whatever they needed for the day, and then they would head back into the village. And uh, for her to be there at this well at noontime 
either meant she ran out of water and needed to go back and get some water, or what we find out in the story is that she was a bit of an outcast in her own community. And so all of this kind of played against her. She was a Samaritan, so Jesus shouldn't have talked to her. She was a woman, so Jesus shouldn't have talked to her. She was even an outcast in her own community, and therefore Jesus probably shouldn't have talked to her. But Jesus didn't let any of those reasons stop him. He was going to speak to her that day. He recognized um, there, this was going to be an opportunity for him to share with her. He was going to care for her that day, and he did, and help her. Sometimes we're pressured not to care for everyone. Sometimes we're pressured just to, uh, to care for the people that we want to care for, and maybe we want to build up walls against others. But we have to look at the example of Jesus. You know, if you remember that parable of the Good Samaritan, we know that in that parable, well, before the parable, Jesus is having a conversation. And in that conversation, the, you know, the question's brought out, what's the greatest commandment? And, and the greatest commandment is to love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. And then we know the, how this continues on. A second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. And this person that was talking with Jesus um, asked the question, well, who's my neighbor? And he really asked this question as kind of a, as a test or, or an opportunity to maybe continue to believe what he's always believed. Because i got to go back a little bit more. You know, when, you, when we read Scripture, you know, especially if you've read Scripture and you've studied Scripture, you'll look at a Scripture and you have an idea of what you believe that that Scripture is saying, right? And so if somebody says to you, what, what, what does this Scripture mean? You've probably, if you studied it, you'll probably say, well, this is what I think it means, and, and, and give that interpretation, that, I, that idea to somebody. Well, the Jews, they had their interpretation, their opinion, their commentary, their ideas about all the laws. And that law was there, love your neighbor as yourself. So over time, they had to decide what that meant. And so when this man asked Jesus, he was trying to find out if Jesus was going to say the same thing that they'd always been taught about what that law meant and maybe confirm to him that the, he, he, he got it right. But here's what they thought it meant. The Jewish leaders, like the Pharisees, the religious leaders, the ones who considered themselves righteous, they interpreted this, love your neighbor as yourself, as since you are righteous, you only have to love those others who are righteous. They're your neighbors. And so if this other person is righteous, that's your neighbor, and that's the one that you can love, just like you love God, but not everybody else. And that's why the Pharisees had no problem not loving the tax collectors and sinners because they weren't, quote, as righteous as they considered themselves, and so they didn't have to consider them as neighbors. And so that's what they did to give themselves an excuse not to care, not to love, to put up that wall and to separate people from their lives. But Jesus didn't do that. He cares about everyone. He cared about that Samaritan woman. She was a Samaritan. Didn't matter to Jesus, he cared about her. She was a woman. Didn't matter to Jesus, he cared about her. She is probably an outcast from her own village. That didn't matter to Jesus. He still cared about her. He cared about her, and, um, and eventually he was able to care about that whole village because once this conversation's over, she's going to go back down to the village, and she's going to tell everybody about Jesus. They're going to come up and talk to him, and he's going to spend some time there caring for those people the, the Samaritans that the Jews didn't like very much. But Jesus cared because he cares about everyone. And he taught them and he, and he helped them in their lives. These events, this, like this event in John chapter 4, is recorded in Scripture to show us that Jesus cares. That he cares for people. Everyone that he comes in contact with, he cares. And as a result of his caring, he serves. And we know, that, we know that that care of Jesus um, goes beyond that because he cares for us today. We're in that same group of everyone. And so when we think about Jesus caring and, and his concern and his love um, continuing, we know that, that it continues to us. And we need to receive that. And we need to follow that example. Not following the example of the, the, the people who called themselves righteous that day of saying, well, I'm going to pick and choose who I will care for, no, 
We need to follow the example of Jesus and say, I will care for everyone just like God has done. And so that's a lesson that we learn um, here from Jesus and this woman at the well. Something else about Jesus and his care. Jesus loves us despite our problems. He loves us despite our problems. Now, Jesus interacted with many people. You read about that as you read through the Gospels. And as we continue to go through the Gospels and, and look at the life of Jesus, I'd encourage you to just start, if you're not reading somewhere in Scripture, start reading through the Gospels to see uh, what um, uh, the different things that Jesus does and the interaction that he has with people. But he had a lot of interaction with a lot of people, and guess what? They all had problems. A lot of them seemed like big problems, but that didn't stop Jesus from loving them. It didn't stop Jesus from caring about them. Again, the religious leaders, they use those problems as their reason, their excuse not to care. They didn't have to care in their mind because these people had all these self-inflicted problems and therefore they didn't have to be concerned with them. But the example we have with Jesus is that he did care. He loved despite all these problems, these personal problems. That Samaritan woman asked for this water that Jesus was talking about. At the end of what I read earlier, he wanted to offer this, this living water. And so she wanted, to, she wanted to have some of that. And uh, notice what Jesus said to her as we continue on from that passage, looking down at verses 15 through 18. The woman said to him, Sir, give me this water so I will not be thirsty, nor come all the way here to draw. He said to her, Go, call your husband and come here. The woman answered and said, I have no husband. Jesus said to her, You have correctly said, I have no husband. For you have had five husbands, and the one whom you now have is not your husband. This you have said truly. Jesus knew that she had had five husbands. Jesus knew that this man that she was with now was not her husband. He knew all that. Now, I don't think he came early to that community and checked the internet to see what it was saying about this woman or picked up the, the, the gossip paper about those that are in, the, in that particular village. He knew because he's Jesus, right? And Jesus, he's God in the flesh, and so we see where he knows what's on a person's heart. Um, he knew that about that woman. Now, we, as we think about her, her own people probably didn't care about her very much and didn't love her very much because of her problems. She was that one that would have been talked about in that particular village. But again, Jesus made it a point to love everyone despite their problems. He didn't use the problems as a reason not to care, not to be concerned about her. You know, Jesus wasn't sitting there at that well and saw this woman coming up and say, oh my, that's the woman who's, um, you know, she's been married five times and, and um, gosh, she's living with this guy now. Maybe if I just sit here, uh, maybe she won't notice me here and, and um, I won't, you know, I won't have to look at her. He didn't do that. Well, she wouldn't have spoken to him because that would have been improper, but, but he spoke to her because he cared about her. And he didn't care about the problems. He didn't let those problems um, deter him from showing love to her. And, and he did that day. Remember that woman caught in adultery? Jesus showed love to her and she had problems. This poor woman, she was, she was being ridiculed, she was being condemned, she was brought to a point where they're ready to say that they were going to stone her to death. I don't know if they were going to go through with it, um, probably using it more as a test to Jesus. And here she was uh, with this crowd around her and um, completely ashamed by all of that. And that's when Jesus answered, you know, hey, if you haven't sinned, cast the first stone. And they started dropping those stones, and they went away. And he says, where are those that have condemned you? And they're gone. He says, I don't condemn you. Go and sin no more. So he, he, he loved this woman enough to not condemn her and to teach her, to encourage her, to direct her in her life of what she needed that day. She received tender mercy from Jesus that day. Um, as he cared for her, he showed love for her, despite her problems. Or we think about Zacchaeus, you know, that wee little man in the sycamore tree. Well, Zacchaeus had what many would say was a good life. He was a rich man, but he didn't have any friends, not Jewish friends anyway. 
because of how he gained his riches as a tax collector, taxing his own people and probably overcharging in taxes to his own people. But Jesus saw him and Jesus cared about him and Jesus knew about his problems and he loved him that day despite the problems that Zacchaeus had. And he called him out of that tree and he invited himself over for lunch and had the opportunity to spend that time with Zacchaeus. And what did Zacchaeus do? He repented that day. He showed a repentant heart, saying he was going to fix anything that he has done wrong and do the right thing um, from this point on. It touched his heart because Jesus cared. He didn't let problems keep him from loving. He showed love despite this man's problems. And we know from Luke chapter 7 that we hear about that woman. We've talked about her a couple of times. This woman that, that um, crashed that lunch party and she's just crying all over Jesus' feet and, and, um, uh, and wiping with her hair and anointing them with perfume. And she did that out of a gratitude in her heart because somehow, some way, she recognized that Jesus loved her. Maybe it was something that there was a conversation somewhere else. I'm not sure exactly what happened, but, but she, she knew this about Jesus and the acceptance. She didn't have that acceptance by the man who owned the house, that Pharisee, Simon, because Simon's over there going, does this guy know who's touching him? Um, does he know what's happening, who this woman is? The community knew she had all these problems. Jesus knew she had all those problems. But he showed love and care and concern for her despite those problems. And you know what? He loves you and he loves me despite our problems. And we have problems. We've all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Every one of us have come up short in our, uh, our desire to follow God and be faithful to God. Every one of us have made mistakes along the way in our relationship with God and our relationship with people. Every one of us have problems, and yet we know we can, we can stand firm on this fact that Jesus loves us despite our problems. He knows our struggles, and he still loves us. Sometimes we listen to the word of the accuser, the devil, who wants us to, uh, to feel bad about ourselves and our problems and use those that our problems and our situation and, and just kind of mix things up like saying, yeah, 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 God might save you. He might make you part of the family, but, but he wants you to kind of stay way over there off by, by yourself. He really doesn't want to have much to do with you. That's not what God tells us. God says he loves us despite our problems. He loves us so that we can hear that same thing from him. I don't condemn you. Go and sin no more. Because we know we stumble. We know we sin. We know we fall short of what we want to do and what God wants us to do. But he continues to pick us up and say, I don't condemn you. Go and sin no more. That's what we have in our relationship with the Lord. And we need to believe that message and remember that message instead of the message of the accuser who wants us to um, not live in this victory that God wants us to live in. I don't condemn you. Go and sin no more. That's what Jesus says. Paul reminds us of that. He says there's no condemnation for us in Christ. We've been set free from our past. We've been set free from our mistakes and sin. That's what God has done for us. So remember today that Jesus loves you despite your problems. He still loves each one of us. And so we need, to, we need to take that in and let that change our lives and give us that um, encouragement to, to follow him faithfully. And we need to follow his example because sometimes we let other people's problems keep us from loving them. And again, we use that excuse and we say, um, I don't, you know, that I don't have to because they have all these problems and I'm not, and therefore I don't have to love them. I don't have to, I don't have to care for them. But we need to follow the example of Jesus. You see, when you read in the New Testament, you'll read examples of somebody, maybe it's a parable or a situation, where somebody receives some mercy, some forgiveness, they receive some gift of God's grace in their life, and then right after that, they have the opportunity to show that same gift to somebody else. And many of them, as the stories are told, they fail. Let's not fail in that. 
We've received the mercy of God. We've received his grace, his forgiveness. And therefore, we need to make sure in our lives that we, sent, we um, continue to show that to others, that they would experience that same mercy from us that we've received from the Lord. So don't push people away. Show love. Show that you care. And one more thought about Jesus is that he demonstrates his care. Jesus demonstrates his care. He doesn't just say he cares. He didn't go to Galilee and say, yeah, there's this woman by the well. I, yeah, I really cared about her. No, he showed her that he cared. Or he didn't, he didn't leave Jericho later and say, yeah, I saw Zacchaeus up in that tree. I didn't do anything, but, but I really cared about him. No, he showed Zacchaeus that he cared. It wasn't just talking about caring. He showed it in his life. God says that he loves the world, and he sent Jesus to show that what he's saying is true. He sent Jesus, his son. And when Jesus cared, he went beyond the immediate felt need of the situation. This woman, you know, as she started talking to Jesus, she just wanted to have this water where she wouldn't be thirsty again, but Jesus was offering her eternal life. Um, Zacchaeus, he just wanted to get a, a, a peek of this guy Jesus, but Jesus offered him the opportunity to repent and to change his life. Uh, so as we think about uh, with Jesus and this woman, that's what he told her at the well. Everyone who drinks of this water will thirst again. But whoever drinks of the water that I will give him shall never thirst. But the water that I will give him will become in him a well of water springing up to eternal life. He offers eternal life. He offers forgiveness of sins. He offers that restored relationship with God. And he demonstrated that care by going to the cross and dying for our sins. You probably remember that famous quote, people don't care um, how much you know until they know how much you care. Well, that's what we need to do. We need to show in our lives that we care. Jesus showed it. He showed his care, and we need to follow his example. Do you show people in your life that you care? Yes, Jesus came to serve, but he served because he cared. And we are called to follow that example and, and, to, and to live and in, the, in that way like Jesus did. And so we want to do what God wants. We want to please God. We want to, uh, you know, obey him and obey his commands. Let's do it because we care, because we love God and we love people and we want to follow the example of Christ. Let's pray. Father, thank you again for um, your word and I thank you for this, um, this event, this story with Jesus and the woman at the well and Help us to learn from it, Father, so that we would uh, learn uh, from you how you want us to live. Help us to be a caring, loving people that um, you show to us through your son, Jesus. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. As we have our invitation song, if there's...